troops of the Voronezh Front, developing a rapid offensive on February 13, 1943 liberated the city of Oboyan, and on February 16, Kharkov. The units of the 6th Army were successfully advancing to the west. The first outpost of the 92nd Frontier Regiment was on the right flank of the army line. Suddenly we received an order to urgently arrive at the command post of the regiment in the village of Cherkesko Lozovaya, which is 10 kilometers north of Kharkov. It is difficult to say what caused such an approach of the first outpost to the headquarters. All this time we, as a rule, were at a considerable distance, even from the battalion command. And then suddenly there was a call to the regimental headquarters. It was known that during the offensive the volume of tasks we performed increased. As part of the breakthrough divisions, for example, began to operate regimental task forces. They were created to capture documents of the enemy's intelligence and counterintelligence agencies, personnel of intelligence schools, to perform other special tasks, and entered the cities with the advanced advancing units. Wasn't the outpost to become such a task force? So, making various assumptions, I walked together with the soldiers through villages and forests on the same roads, on which I left in September 1941. One day we found ourselves in a small village. I remembered it during our withdrawal from the border, and then the military whirlwind had bypassed the village, and now the village had been spared bombing and artillery shelling. But the new occupation order has not passed. For about two years the fascist administration mocked and lashed the villagers. As soon as the outpost camped, the soldiers were immediately surrounded by people. They looked into the soldiers' faces, as if not believing that liberation had come. They began to tell about those who had been taken to Germany, about how Hitler's occupants had robbed them clean. It turned out that all villages were taxed. It was necessary to hand over so much meat, wool, eggs, bread. Even cats and dogs were taxed. It was worse than under the Tsar, or the landlord complained the villagers. Under the landlord at least not everything was taken away, but here it was like locusts give and take, and if not a short conversation, they would beat you or take you to a foreign land, or even shoot you. There was no end to the questions. How do people live on Soviet territory now? What new laws and regulations have been issued? Are there any benefits or help for those families whose fathers or sons are at the front? We answered that we knew. And we saw people's faces brighten. They began to smile as if they were born again. They believed that the hated invaders would be defeated and Soviet power would return to their villages. Their own people's power, which would not give offence to anyone. The villagers touched with their hands the hem of our good quality fur coats and evaluated them with peasant thoroughness, rejoicing that the Soviet fighters were so warmly dressed. Hey, in such a coat and Valenki no frost is not terrible and for two years fascist radio shouted to us that the Red Army was undressed and stripped, and that there were only old men left in it. The soldiers answered. You see for yourself how we're dressed and clothed. Old men, it's true, there are among us. However, young men are in the majority. It was noticed by the villagers that mostly young soldiers drafted into the army, and that they look good, healthy, cheerful, ready to beat the Germans to the end. At the beginning of January 1943 in the Red Army there was a transition to a new form of dress. New insignia, epaulettes were introduced. This was done in the spirit of the best traditions of the Russian army. The villagers who remembered the old uniform were surprised and looked at our epaulettes with curiosity. One old man, who had been gathering courage for a long time, came close to me and, coughing into his fist, asked. And what shall we call you now? Well... Them he nodded at the men, as it was in the old army, soldiers. And you, mister? Lieutenant? I smiled. The uniform father did not change the essence. We were comrades and we are still comrades. Here he is, I pointed at Goncharov, the political officer of the outpost, a lieutenant, and I, its commander, a senior lieutenant. They saw us off warmly. We were hotly admonished not to give rest to the Sapostats, to take revenge for their desecrated land, to reach Berlin by all means, and then only to return home. We had such meetings more than once, but more often instead of villages and hamlets we saw ashes, skeletons of furnaces or chimneys sticking out of the ground, causing terrible longing.
feral cats and dogs roamed the ruins. Sometimes suddenly a lid would lift from the snow-covered rubble in some village and the head of a man. An old man, a child or a woman, would emerge from the blackened hole. The soldiers would untie their duffel bags and give their rations to the starving people. After such meetings, the soldiers usually became glum and taciturn. After all, many of them had families on the other side of the Dnieper. I remember we decided to spend the night in one village. I looked at the map 280 yards. We came three destroyed houses. There was nothing left of the rest. The Nazis burned the village to the ground. We didn't find a single person. We never found out what tragedy happened in the village. Pictures of destruction, stories about Hitlerite atrocities, mass shootings, mass extermination of Soviet people caused burning hatred to the enemy. Much of what we used to read about in newspapers, leaflets or heard on the radio, we now saw with our own eyes. The consequences of the fascist occupation, the results of the new order on the territory temporarily seized by the enemy appeared before us. We were met by orphaned land human grief. All Soviet soldiers who passed through the liberated land saw it. They saw the enormous scale of destruction and annihilation. Today we know exact figures and facts. Only in Belarus the occupants killed 2,200,000 people, destroyed 4,300, triple zero houses, 7,000 schools, libraries, hospitals. In Ukraine they killed 4 million Soviet citizens. In the Russian Federation 1,700,000. They wanted to kill more, but did not have time. On the liberated territory there was a recruitment to the Red Army, with a great desire went to serve young people who were convinced by their own experience that they have what and whom to protect. The political department of our Voronezh front in those days addressed to young soldiers with a special leaflet, Comrade Soldiers. It said, You are eyewitnesses of monstrous atrocities and violence of German executioners. Many of you have experienced all the horrors of the fascist yoke. One of you had his father, brother, a close comrade shot by the Germans. Another one had his mother killed by Hitler's bandits, his beloved wife dishonoured, and his sister taken away to cursed Germany. The third one had his house burned down, his cattle taken away, bread raided, his family and small children condemned to starvation. It is they fascist robbers destroyed and burned the beautiful old Russian city of Voronezh. It was they the despicable robbers who robbed and ruined the population of Soviet Ukraine, Voronezh and Kursk regions. They killed and raped in Kharkov, Kursk, Belgorod, Chugev, Elgov, shot and hanged hundreds and thousands of our fathers and brothers on poles. Who among you has not clenched his fists at the sight of these heinous atrocities? Who has not had his heart bleed? Who among you has not spoken the dreaded words of vengeance wait, barbarians? The time will come, and we will avenge you for everything. That time has come. Now you are in the Red Army. The motherland has given you weapons in your hands. Now you have something to avenge the damned Hitlerites, something to beat them with. So unleash the full force of this weapon on the heads of despicable bandits. Revenge them mercilessly. Hit them without a miss. Pour all the power of your hatred into battle. Avenge all the pain and suffering of your wives, mothers and children. Be brave and bold in the offensive, firm and persistent in the defence. Fight without sparing your blood, without sparing your lives. Let not a single Hitlerite will not escape from under your deadly blow. And Soviet soldiers showed examples of bravery and courage, selfless devotion to the motherland, love for their people. They went into battle, despising death. It was in those February days of 1943 that we all learned about the heroic feat of Alexander Matrasov, who covered the embrasure of an enemy bunker with his body in the battle for the village of Chernyushki. On his feet, on the feet of dozens and hundreds of other fighters and commanders we brought up border guards. Retreating, the enemy left its residency in our rear. We had to identify and eliminate it. In accordance with the directive of the main apartment of the commander of German troops on the Eastern Front, Hitler's occupation authorities used former white guards, nationalists, kulaks, traitors, criminals as proxies and accomplices of German fascism during the occupation. This scum helped the secret field police, gendarmes, local commandants to get intelligence about the front line, to find the necessary resources for the German army, to identify communists, partisans, families of Red Army soldiers. 
On February 8, 1943, German intelligence agent B, who worked at the headquarters of a German division, was detained. She identified communists, partisans, Red Army servicemen, personally went to search for Soviet pilots who had made an emergency landing. The agent handed over to German intelligence a list containing the names of 28 party workers and partisans. When the Germans withdrew, she was left behind for the purpose of espionage. But there were other meetings. With our Soviet people that, remaining in the temporarily occupied territory, did not go in the service of the enemy, but acted as their conscience and the heart of a Soviet patriot prompted them. We met with partisans, underground fighters, party and Komsomol activists, who by their goodwill, as they could, fought the enemy without fear of death. One evening we found ourselves in the garden of a Dacha village a few kilometres from Kharkov. Most of the Dakas were empty. Only in a few houses in the windows flickered lights. It was still a long way to Cherkesko Lozovaya. The soldiers got tired, and it was time to think about a night's lodging. I called Gorodnyansky. Check, comrade petty officer. What kind of houses are these? Whether it is possible to settle down in them for the night? A dozen minutes later, Gorodnyaniki returned and reported. There is one house. True, it will be cramped, but it's clean. And the tenants invite us, they say there is enough room for everyone. We went into the garden. Not far from the gate, we could see a large one-story wooden, almost square building with many doors and a solid terrace. We entered it. We were placed in the rooms. There were two or three soldiers for each room. In one room we settled down with political officer Goncharov. Petty officer Gorodnyansky brought dinner. The hostess came in, a woman in her forties. She warmed tea. We took off our jackets and sat down at the table. The woman looked at us for a long time and then asked, Are you medics? No, I replied. I am a commander, and he is a political officer. Do you have anyone sick? No, said the woman. Such buttonholes as yours were worn by border guards before the war. But border guards serve on the border. This is the front. So I thought medics. They also have green buttonholes, only a little darker. And she was silent. Her face was stamped with thought. We realised that the woman wanted to say something but did not dare. I continued the conversation. Did you have someone who served on the border? No, she answered, and thought again. I said that my political officer and I met the war on the western border. We went through these places. Now we are going back to our native outposts. That's how it is, the woman was surprised, and confessed before the war one worked in Kharkov border guard school. How many we saw off the students of this school to the border? And she looked at me. Then at the political officer, didn't any of you by any chance study at our school? No, I answered. Ivan Ivanovich became an officer in the war, and I graduated from the Saratov Border Guard School. The woman sat down and began to tell about the black days of the Nazi occupation. I understood her heartache. Then I asked her, Why didn't you evacuate with the school? Oh, it's a difficult question, said the woman. Is it possible to talk about it? And who would believe me? except that man. Who is this man? He worked at our school. When the front approached Kharkov, he told me you are a native of Belgorod. Go there. There our man will come to you and tell you what you need to do behind enemy lines. She poured us some tea and went on time past. No one came to me. I decided to return to Kharkov in the hope of meeting familiar people. But there was nothing to live on, so I got a job working in the garden. The Germans opened a fruit processing office in the building. They canned apples, pears, plums. The workers who did this work disappeared after three or four months, and new ones arrived instead. This seemed suspicious to me. Then I met one of the new arrivals. He worked in the clerk's office. My acquaintance said that it was not a fruit processing office at all, but a branch of the German intelligence school. I have collected a lot of material about this intelligence school, and the people who studied there. Advise me how I can find that comrade who left me behind enemy lines. Yes, I remarked, that's interesting. But the man who left you in the rear is quite difficult to find in this situation. And is he alive? 
Here's what I'll advise you, we have to leave. But after us will come here employees of territorial bodies of state security. Tell them everything. The woman thanked us and left. And I lay and thought about this courageous patriot who had assigned herself and carried out a difficult reconnaissance mission, risking her life. The information that she had gathered about Hitler's intelligence school and about those who studied in it would be useful to our Czechists. I do not remember the name of this woman, but even today I remember about her, a Soviet citizen who fulfilled her duty behind enemy lines. So unexpectedly we visited the territory of one of the intelligence schools that trained agents, with whom we had to fight all this time, with whom we still had to fight, until the end of the war and after it. In the morning we continued our march. We passed Kolodnaya Gora and found ourselves on the northern outskirts of Kharkov, and in the afternoon we arrived in the village of Chekesko Lozovaya. It lay in a deep gully along the bank of the frozen river. In the centre, on a small square, towered the school building. The regiment headquarters was located there. I reported to the regiment commander Colonel Blumin about my arrival and about the overnight stay in the former German reconnaissance school. He made a note about it on a sheet of paper and then asked how we reached how people felt the mood. Then he showed a telegram in which the chief of the rear guard troops of the Voronezh front ordered our regiment to go to the line Nijnaya Suravatka Novaya Vodyaga, the command post of the regiment to be located in the town of Krasny Kut. After a moment's silence, Blumin added, the Red Army units are approaching Dnipropetrovsk. Every day increases the area protected by the regiment. The reserve battalion is already engaged. Now I have put your outpost in the reserve. Tomorrow morning you will be subordinated to the sapper and training platoons with which you must go to Krasny Kut. Prepare there a place for cantonment of the regimental headquarters. We will follow you. Blumin took out a map, showed it to me here is the calculation for the march, the route of movement. Prepare the men. We left at dawn. The starting point, the city of Dagachi, passed at the appointed time. Then we got out on the highway Kharkov Bogokov. On its roadsides there was a lot of broken enemy equipment. Especially there was a lot of it in the area of Okovatka, where the hottest battles were fought. Tilted with turned sides of tanks, broken guns, burned cars of all brands of Europe, all this is now frozen, stopped, inactive. Nothing so pleases a fighter at the front as a defeated enemy. Only those who survived the difficult summer of the 41st, who stood and withstood Hitler's tank avalanches, could appreciate all that was now happening on the Soviet-German front. And though we had to retreat and withdraw more than once, to lose dear people and precious equipment even now, but nothing could change the general course of events, to drown out the victory song sounding in our souls. Passing by the enemy combat vehicles, we looked at them not without pride. The eyes of the soldiers seemed to say, well, the vastness of Russia was not to the teeth. We attacked the wrong people. We heard some remarks. Our artillerymen gave them a good fight. No ours. In the middle of the day we got off the highway on a country road and went straight through the woods to Krasny Kut. It got dark. We heard dogs barking ahead. The head sentry reported that the forest was over and houses could be seen. According to the estimated time, it was supposed to be Krasny Kut. Having positioned the men at the edge of the forest, I went with the sentries to the houses of the street that started here. Sergeant Shkuro knocked on the window of the outermost house. No one answered the knock. Then Shkuro drummed more insistently on the glass. The floorboards creaked. Someone came out into the hay and, without opening the door, asked, what do you want? Our own. Don't be afraid. The door was ajar. I shone my lantern on the old man standing on the threshold. Tell me, father, are there any of our people in town? No, said the old man in a hoarse voice. You will be the first. And he invited us into the house. We learned that there were no Germans in town, but there were local police. The German commandant is at the sugar factory. How far is that from here? About 15 kilometers, maybe. Are there many soldiers there? They said about 10, maybe a little more. Do you know where a policeman lives on your street? I know. Then, Father, get dressed, 
go after him and tell him that a German officer is staying at your house, that some of their unit has come and they want a policeman. The old man left. We placed Sergeant Vekshin's squad around the house and Sergeant Gorodniansky and three soldiers were left in the hay. They let the old man return as agreed, but the policeman was seized and his weapon was taken from him. He stood in the middle of the room, neither alive nor dead, not realising what had happened, but feeling that something irreparable had happened. Well, mister, policeman, let's get acquainted. He stretched out, hands at his seams. A fine perspiration covered his face. We had no time for polemics, so we got right down to business. Do you know where the chief of police lives? I do. Do you want to atone for your guilt before the Soviet people? Yes, assured the policeman. Then listen. You will go to the chief now and tell him that a German unit has arrived on your street, its commander is staying at your house, and he is summoned to your house. Take the chief of police to your house, but don't make any jokes. I'll do as you say, the policeman babbled. Well, let's go then. The policeman led us to his house and opened the door. Several rooms were clean, but empty. In the kitchen on the table stood an open bottle of vodka and a snack. Where's the family? I'm not from here. I'm not from Krasnokutsky's. All right, run after your boss. The policeman ran away, and we waited for his return. Will the scoundrel keep his word, or will he make a fuss? A muffled chatter came from the street, and the snow crunched under our feet. Two shadows approached the house. Gorodniansky shouted. Alt. Before the chief of police had time to realise it, he was laid on the snow and disarmed. So one by one we gathered by midnight the entire German administration of the city in the police headquarters. It was, in fact, the police chief's house, some building he had converted into his personal mansion and police headquarters at the same time. There was a lot of good in the house. The chief of the Krasnokutsk police was settling in. It was felt, for a long time. He robbed people thoroughly. There was a piano, mahogany furniture, carpets and dishes, plenty of everything. The policemen sat huddled together, not daring to open their mouths, as criminals do when caught red-handed. The drunken, flabby face of the chief of police expressed confusion. His fat eyes were running around, reflecting fear, confusion and annoyance how he had been taken, outwitted and tricked. While Jishmoldinov was interrogating these scoundrels, we were busy with the German garrison at the sugar factory. We learned from the police that the garrison consisted of 12 Hitlerites. Having consulted with Goncharov, we decided to send Petty Officer Gorodniansky for liquidation. Such a choice was not accidental. The Petty Officer was an experienced border guard. He began his service in the frontier troops in the 92nd Paramitial Border Guard Detachment. On the first day of the war he entered the battle, beat the fascists on the Sana. He broke through the enemy encirclement more than once. He was a strong-willed, brave commander, witty, savvy fighter. Outwardly, Gorodniansky looked like a pure-blooded Aryan, besides he knew German language well. Once political officer Goncharov told me how, when leaving the enemy encirclement at the beginning of the war, petty officer Gorodniansky put on the uniform of a German ephriator, sat on a motorcycle, attached to the column of Germans and scouted the route for the commandant's exit. Petty officer Gorodniansky did not have to see the day of the final defeat of fascism, in April 1945, he was seconded to the reconnaissance company of the 24th Infantry Division and soon fell to the death of the brave, just a few days before the end of the war. It was in Czechoslovakia. The battalion, which I commanded by that time, was on a march. At a small Czechoslovak village we made a halt, and then we saw our soldiers on a hillock, installing four-sided columns with stars on freshly dug graves. We were involuntarily drawn there. What a shame to die at the very end of the war. I wanted to pay the last honours to those who fell in one of the final battles in the liberation of the Czechoslovak land from the brown Hitler plague. What was my amazement when on one of the monuments I saw a photo of Petty Officer Gorodniansky? From excitement I could not read the inscription under it. I asked those who buried him. Is this Petty Officer Gorodniansky? 
Yes, answered a sergeant from the funeral team. This is the platoon commander of our reconnaissance company. Our platoon was the first to break into this village. Over there, on the heights, the Nazis had a bunker and a machine gun. They did not allow the regiment to move along the road, and the mountains prevented to bypass this place. The platoon commander led us into the attack. We destroyed the breach, but Hitler's bullet cut short the life of our commander. We gave a threefold farewell salvo to the petty officer of the first outpost, Gorodniansky, and his combat comrades who fell together with him and went further to the west. This is who, in early March 1943, was sent with Sergeant Pugashev's squad on police horses to the sugar factory to destroy the German commandant's office. The border guards approached the factory at about four o'clock in the morning. Gorodniansky brought with him Sergeant Pugachev's squad and the first policeman we took. Having positioned the men at the gatehouse, he and the policeman went to the door. Well, policeman knock. The knock was answered in German by a sleepy voice. Who's there? Mister. Commandant has an urgent package from the chief of police. Footsteps were heard at the door. Then the door spinner opened. Seeing the face of a familiar policeman and the packet in his hand, the German opened the door. In a moment, the sentry lay motionless on the floor. Sergeant Pugashev's detachment together with Sergeant Gorodniansky penetrated into the factory, surrounded the building where Hitlerites were located and blocked it. Grenades flew into the windows. Then the soldiers combed the rooms with machine gun fire. All this took a few minutes. The German garrison was finished. In the morning, citizens of the city began to come to us. Having learned that all the police had been arrested and the chief of police was in the hands of the border guards, who had fallen into Krasny Kut, as if from the sky, people began to tell us what the Nazi servants were doing in the town. Especially angrily, they reprimanded the police chief. Well, you bastard, have you stocked up on goodies for life? You said that the German order on the Soviet land is established forever. What do you say now? What will you say when they hang you from an aspen tree? When we heard that there were Soviet fighters in the city, some partisans came to us from the forest. I asked them to escort the German servants to Kharkov, to the military counterintelligence. The partisans transferred the policemen to their destination. Two days we stayed in Krasny Kut, preparing the premises for the arrival of the regiment headquarters, dealing with individuals who did this or that work for the Nazis looking for secret agents, talking to the population. People were given back the property taken from them. It seemed unusual for them that at last it was possible to walk the streets again without looking back and to say what was on your mind without fear. The town of Krasny Kut, which stood in the middle of a wooded area away from the big roads, came to life. And the regimental headquarters did not approach. But on the right and left began to hear artillery cannonade. At that time, it was difficult to give an explanation. Only many years later, flipping through the pages of an archive file, I read the report of the battalion commander to the commander of the 92nd Frontier Regiment, 3.3.43.20.00. I can't go to the line according to the order. The enemy in some areas went on counter-offensive. The commander of the 3rd Battalion, Pashkov. We were in the 1st Battalion, but we found this very document. The essence was the same, something happened at the front. And it turned out then as follows. Hitler's command, having regrouped forces, created southwest of Kharkov a powerful fist, surpassing our advancing troops in this direction. German troops went on the offensive. If the rear and communications of the Voronezh front had not been so stretched and not so exhausted in continuous offensive battles, the enemy would not have had a significant success here. But in this situation, the Soviet troops with great difficulty held back the frantic onslaught of the enemy. The Sixth Army, in the rear of which we were, was forced to withdraw to Kharkov. Colonel Blumen received an order from the Chief of Troops to protect the rear of the front to withdraw the battalions of the regiment to a new frontier. On March 6th, a liaison from the regimental headquarters arrived to us. The outpost was ordered to return to the village of Chakesko Lozovaya. Having calculated on the map the route of movement, which was a good hundred kilometres, we decided not to go to the main highway bogakov kharkov but to go by country roads. It was shorter and safer. We set out at once, expecting by dawn to cross the bridge over the river 
near the village of Olkovaka, as the Germans could cut off the outpost and its attached sapper and training platoon's escape routes. Only we passed Olkovatka and approached the village Perisechnoi as a column of German troops appeared at the crossroads from Bogodokov and Poltava. We turned into the forest towards Degaki, so we reached Chernesko Luzova. The headquarters of the regiment had already been taken off. Here is what is said about it in the report of the regiment headquarters at night from March 8th to March 9th, but 1943, our units and parts began to withdraw through Cherkesko Luzovaya. To restore order in the village, left the first outpost with the deputy commander of the regiment, Major Bashmakov. The regiment headquarters withdrew to the village of Mayansa. Our first outpost remained in the village. Major Bashmakov and Captain Tsigankov soon went to Kharkov, to the headquarters of the 3rd Tank Army, to clarify the situation. We, fulfilling the order, blocked all the approaches to Cherkesko Lozova. In order not to tie up the actions of the outpost, we sent our small rear with senior Lieutenant Diyayay Moldenov, following the regimental headquarters. Our midnight Sergeant Pugachev entered the house where we were stationed, and with him a tall man in a papaka and a black Cossack burka. Colonel Samokin, he introduced himself. Where can we camp here for the night? I believe that you are Colonel Samokin, I said, rising, but I ask you to show your documents. He held out an identity card, which showed that he was the chief of the special department of the cavalry corps. I advised Colonel Samokin to stay at the school where the regiment headquarters was located. I added that our regimental car was there, and that a sergeant and a chauffeur were resting in one of the classrooms. All right, agreed Samokin, please take us there. Following the colonel, fifteen more men arrived at the school. All of them were dressed in the same Cossack burkas as their chief. Having asked the colonel's per colonel's permission, I returned to my men. At three o'clock in the morning I was awakened by Sergeant Ostakov, who was sleeping with the driver of the car in the school. You are called Colonel Samokin. In the room where Samokin was, a candle was burning on the table. I reported to the colonel about the arrival. How many men do you have? he asked. Twenty with me. Tell you what, senior lieutenant, in an hour we'll dismount. There, ahead of us, is our squadron. With the dawn he will make a little noise and begin to withdraw. There are a lot of enemy tanks in Dugaki. As you see, if we can't do anything as a unit, you and your men won't help us. Report to your regimental commander that I ordered you to withdraw with our cover. Soon Colonel Samokin and his accompanying horsemen rode away. We waited for dawn. Suddenly from the direction of Dargiki came thunderous rumblings. A second later shells began to burst on the square with a dry crackle, and machine gun bursts crackled in the garden. The cavalry galloped through the village. The chauffeur came running and reported the car was wrecked. Sergeant Ostakov was killed. Several shells had hit the school at once, so there was no one to bury. The cavalrymen rode through the village again, apparently the last ones. On the slopes of the heights crawled German tanks with a troop of machine gunners. On them immediately from the Belgorod highway our cannons struck with a quick fire. Well, Politruk, I turned to Goncharov, and we, perhaps, it's time to go. Yes, there's no one else to hold here. Too bad about a Ostakov, said Goncharov sadly. Yes, Ivan, that's how life is. But with a Ostakov I went from the Carpathians to these places. How ridiculous death is. We were already in the field behind the village, when suddenly appeared enemy planes and fired on us from machine guns. Tanks came after us. They broke out on the highway Kharkov Belgorod. For three hours we walked through the forest. Then the way was blocked by a deep and wide gully, along which a huge village stretched for several kilometres. Our cars, tanks, wagons appeared. It turned out that this was Kazakia Lopen, through which the Red Army units were passing. We joined them and reached the village of Murom. Here we caught up with our wagon and settled down for the night. The night passed quietly. Having rested, we moved on. Somewhere near Volchansk, the outpost crossed the Seversky Donets, and late in the evening found themselves in Volchansky Yakutari. We spent the night hoping to establish communication with the regiment headquarters in the morning. 
However, no sooner had we settled down than I was informed that some military men had appeared in the nearby village of Efremov and they did not speak Russian and were dressed differently from ours. Although we were across the river, seemingly in the rear, but everything happens in war. So I ordered my deputy, Senior Lieutenant Dizamoldinov, to find out who had shown up in the village. Soon he came back and reported that there were Czechoslovaks in the village. We knew that a separate battalion of Chalian of Czechoslovaks would fight on our front. The message from the front headquarters said that Czechoslovak soldiers and officers were dressed in overcoats, pants and gymnasiums made of khaki cloth of English cut, headdress and Ushanka hat with a cockade with a lion on it, Soviet weapons. For identification the password freedom was set by the name of their battalion commander Lieutenant Colonel Ludwig Svoboda. In the morning with political officer Goncharov I decided to look into the Czechoslovaks in Efremovka. We found the house where the headquarters, or rather the battalion office, was located. There were several corporals and two officers. They met us in a friendly manner. Some of them spoke Russian well. It turned out that the battalion was coming out of the battle in the area of Sokolov near Afer. There was a baptism of fire of the first Czechoslovak unit on the Soviet-German front. And how did they fight? Good, it was a hot battle. We didn't let the fascists through Menge. Czechoslovaks fulfilled the order of the Soviet command. We learned that a battalion of NKVD troops fought together with Czechoslovak soldiers near Marifa. Czechoslovaks told us about the battle of Soviet soldiers in the village of Taranovka, which lay on the way to Sokolovo. They did not know the details, but noticed that our soldiers were the first to take the Hitlerites' blow, which gave the battalion an opportunity to enter the battle not from the get-go, but in advance prepared for defence. Only after some time details of the battle in Taranovka became known. In March 1943 there was committed a feat similar to the feat of 28 heroes Panfilovsi. In Taranovka heroically fought a platoon commanded by Guards Lieutenant P. N. Shironin. Almost all the soldiers of the platoon died, but did not miss the Nazi tanks. All 25 brave Sharonin's men were awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Czechoslovak soldiers fought heroically. German fascist troops, who were making the main blow at Taranovka, Sokolovo, Mirefa in the direction of Kharkov from the southwest, did not break the heroic resistance of Czechoslovak soldiers. The battle at Sokolovo became a bright page in the combat history of the Czechoslovak army. I must say that the Czechoslovaks in Sokolovo fought as one can fight only for their homeland, wrote the former commander of the Soviet division, on the site of which the Czechoslovaks fought. Having learned that near Kharkov the first Czechoslovak division was operating, Hitlerites tried to do everything to destroy it. But they did not succeed. However, they got a few severely wounded Czechoslovak soldiers. Fascists subjected them to terrible tortures cut off ears, noses, gouged out eyes. We saw our tortured comrades tied to poles and exposed by the fascists for intimidation, said one of the Czechoslovak officers, with whom we met in Efremovka, they wanted to frighten us, but we were not afraid we only hate the fascists more now. We learned that the main forces of the battalion with Commander L. Svoboda were still on their way to Efremovka, and we said goodbye to our new acquaintances. It was a sunny March morning. Czechoslovak soldiers came out of the houses into the street. They gathered in groups, talked animatedly, and then sang some Czech song. We did not understand the words of the song, but the melody was heartfelt, similar to the tune of our Ukrainian songs. We learned that it was a song about their homeland. Czech and Slovak soldiers sang it with inspiration. We approached one group and said hello. The soldiers answered Nazdar at the same time. Three soldiers separated from the other group and came toward us. One of them, smiling broadly, came very close to me and asked, Mr. Lieutenant, and you do not recognize us. I stared at the approaching soldiers, trying to remember where I could have seen them. No, I admitted, I don't recognize them. Then, mixing Czech, Slovak, Ukrainian and Russian words, the soldiers began to explain that they knew me. It was in the fall of 1940. They were detained by the border guards of our outpost near the village of Krivki. And I remembered the many-faced, colourfully dressed groups of people, almost every day brought by border guards to the outpost citizens of Czechoslovakia, leaving fascist captivity for the USSR. 
In one of these groups were those who recognised me now in Ifremovka. The soldiers recalled the details of the border crossing and the time spent at our border outpost. Mr. Nadporuchik, do you remember how your corporal used to feed us right on the street? There were many of us at your outpost then. Is that corporal with you now? No, I answered. Petty officer Vershinin was killed in 1942 near Aboyan. It's a pity, said one of the Czechoslovaks. He was a kind man. Then the soldiers told how from Skol, where the headquarters of our detachment was located, they came to Elvov and then to Kazakhstan. They worked in a state farm. And when the war started, they asked to join the Czechoslovakian unit being formed in the Soviet Union. Now Czechs and Slovaks with weapons in their hands fight for their abandoned home, for their homeland. Where did your formation take place? Oh, far away from here, in the Urals, in Buzuluk. And how did you get to Kharkov? We wanted to go to the front to fight the Nazis, so they sent us here. They also told how they fought with Hitlerites and how they did not yield to them. Czechoslovak warriors were happy that at last they had beaten fascists and fought with weapons in their hands for the freedom of their homeland. This unexpected meeting touched me to the depths of my soul. It was as if I met old acquaintances. It was pleasant to realise that young people correctly understood and evaluated the events in a difficult moment for their and my homeland. We said goodbye warmly, wished each other success and to meet again after the war. I do not know which of these Czechoslovak soldiers reached their home. Our paths never crossed again, although I saw Czechoslovakia when I entered that country with my battalion with the advancing Red Army units. From Ifremovka we went to the town of Volchansk. In Volchansk our troops were not present. The aviation fighter regiment based here until the last moment changed the airfield. Only an airfield maintenance battalion remained. But even that was leaving. But we were lucky in other things. The city executive committee helped us to get food at one of the bases. We were on our way back. But not far from Seversky Donitz, the deputy commander of the 3rd Tank Kotelnikov Corps, whose troops were coming to this area, came to us. Are our troops in the city? The general asked. And having heard the answer, he said yes, although the river is raging, but without troops it is not an obstacle. Tell me, is there an outpost of your regiment in the village of Bili Kolodes? It must be ours. Our battalion is on duty in this direction. I have already given the chief of the outpost the necessary orders, said the general. You too will be at my fingertips for the time being. In the village of Bili Kolodes there was indeed an outpost of our regiment, commanded by senior lieutenant Vasily Anisimov. So we got in direct subordination to the deputy commander of the 3rd Tank Corps. Then the advanced units of the corps began to arrive, and the general, having informed us that our regiment was concentrating in Bolshetroitskoye, allowed us to go to the unit. On the second day we reached the village of Bolshetroitskoye. The regiment went out to protect the rear of the 7th Guards Army, the headquarters of which was stationed near the village of Zimovenki in the forest. The headquarters of our 1st Battalion was located together with the regiment headquarters in Bolshetroitskoye. Captain Tachanin by this time was promoted. Instead of him, I was appointed to temporarily perform the duties of the battalion commander. By the end of March 1943, the troops of the Voronezh Front in hard fighting stopped the enemy counter-offensive and consolidated on the line Krasnopoli, north of Belgorod, and further on the left bank of the Seversky Donets. On this section of the front, the southern facet of the so-called Kursk protrusion was formed, which played an important role in the subsequent hostilities. Thus the calculations of Hitler's command to encircle and destroy a large group of Soviet troops in Donbass and in the area southwest of Kharkov, and then at Kursk were thwarted. Having suffered heavy losses, the enemy was forced to go to the defence. After the winter offensive battles, which ended with victories of the Red Army, there was a relative calm at the front. Spring was coming into its own. The sun shone brightly. The spring waters rumbled and murmured. Savarsky Donitz came out of its banks. The black earth of Kursk steamed under the hot rays of the sun. The air warmed up. Meadows and glades turned green. The forest was covered with pale green. Gardens turned white. Birds sang restlessly. 
the dirt roads gradually dried up. Army engineers and local residents, mostly teenagers and women, were putting them in order. Bridges were repaired, potholes and craters were filled up. Along the road stretched a string of wagons, columns of cars, ammunition, guns, food, summer uniforms were brought to the front line. To the rear half fur coats, Valenki, cotton pants and jackets, artillery shells, containers, trophy equipment. More and more often at our checkpoints one could hear, guards private so-and-so, after treatment I am going to my unit, or guards sergeant. Guards lieutenant, I'm going to NSK with the replenishment. On the chests of soldiers and officers shone the sign guards. It was a pleasure to observe the huge flow of people and equipment. All this testified to our growing power. By the summer of 1943, the Soviet industry produced in one month alone about 3,000 airplanes and more than 2,000 tanks and self-propelled artillery units. There was a sharp increase in the number of new weapons. Technical equipment of the troops, the changed conditions of warfare, the growth of combat skills of the personnel and command staff, the implementation of new tasks led to further improvement of the organisation of the Red Army. The transition of rifle troops to the corps system was largely completed, which greatly improved management. Large artillery units of the reserve of the general command were created, new tank units, formations and armies were formed, which had high manoeuvrability and great striking power. We saw much of what was happening near the front line on the southern front of the Kursk protrusion. In the rear of the Seventh Guards Army, we saw with our own eyes. Except that the communication of our soldiers and sergeants with the guards brought us the commanders some grief, soldiers arriving in the regiment from the Red Army units and from hospitals for replenishment complained. I got here myself, I don't know where. I was an artilleryman, and now who? In my unit, I would have long ago put the guard's badge on my chest, but here I could not wait for an award, no matter how I served. There were even requests for secondment to their regiments and units, although for health reasons the soldiers could not be in the active army. We, commanders and political workers, together with our activists, had to make a lot of efforts to instill in people love for their unit and service. We told the arriving soldiers about the history of our regiment and the frontier detachment, about combat deeds of its fighters and commanders, about everything we had seen and experienced. Sometimes one of the former border guards would take out of his duffel bag a green cap, put it on proudly and say, Why are you, my dear friend, so downhearted? Do you know how we guarded the border before the war, how we met the enemy on dark rainy nights? In this green cap we were the first to meet the fiery morning of June 22, 1941. All that Hitler and his generals had concentrated to attack our homeland in the first hour of the war fell on the border outposts. But it was not so easy to deal with us. Look, it's the third year of the war, and we're still fighting, fighting the enemy. No, you shouldn't complain, brother. There was a time when we stood against tanks without guns or air force. We were the last to retreat. So each of us deserved the guard's badge long ago, but they didn't give it to us then. Are you complaining about the real life? Think about it. You won't recognise the one who was sent by Hitler's intelligence warehouses. Military echelons will blow up. Enemy aviation and artillery will hit the targets accurately. Bridges and crossings will be destroyed. Of course, to fight in the guard's unit is honourable. But someone should be here and close the road to the secret enemy in our rear. Such conversations were not wasted. The mood of the former frontline soldiers gradually changed. They, as they say, felt the taste of service and conscientiously performed the tasks assigned to them. In late April or early May 1943, we received an order in which the command congratulated the soldiers and commanders of the regiment with a high government award. By the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR on April 14, 1943, our 92nd Frontier Regiment was awarded the Order of the Red Banner for exemplary performance of combat missions of the command at the fronts of the fight against the Nazi invaders and the valour and courage shown. Each fighter, commander deeply realised that in this high award there is a part of his personal feat. With the announcement of the order and stopped unnecessary conversations, intensified preparation for the summer battles began. The troops of the Voronezh front, occupying the defence from Suja to Volchansk, created an insurmountable deeply echeloned frontier with a well-developed system of trenches and passages, 
a large number of all kinds of anti-tank and anti-personnel barriers. And on the section of the 7th Guards Army from Belgorod to Shebikin, defensive work was intensively carried out. In the ground buried not only the forward units, but also the rear of the army. Local residents provided great assistance to the troops in the creation of defensive lines. By the end of May, the works in the defensive areas were completely finished. Traffic on the front roads was almost stopped. All roads were mined at night, and passages were guarded by sappers and border guards. Being in the fighting order of the second echelon of the army, our regiment continued to fight with the enemy intelligence, uprooted its agents and sabotage groups, carried out a number of other activities related to maintaining the necessary order in the rear of the army. In any situation, border guards showed courage, resourcefulness, sometimes entering into an armed clash with the enemy. I remember a case that occurred at that time at one of the checkpoints of the battalion. Not far from the village of Bolsha Troitskogo was on duty Sergeant Anisimov with four men. Sometime in the evening a rider dressed in military uniform appeared on the road among cars and carts. Noticing the barrier and the border guards, he turned back. This did not escape the attention of petty officer Anisimov. Stop Anisimov shouted. The unknown man raised his automatic rifle and, having given a line to the border guards, tried to get away, wounding one soldier but he was also wounded by return fire and fell off his horse. The detainee was sent to the hospital. When he recovered, he was handed over to the counterintelligence agencies and exposed as a major agent of the enemy. Why did you open fire? The investigator asked him, and not try to show documents, rely on chance. Hitler's spy hopelessly waved his hand. I lost the entire group thrown out with me on parachutes to the rear of the Red Army. The parachutists ran into the border guards and were detained. And I had no hope, having seen the border guards, to get out successfully. I tried to escape. But I was stopped. I had no choice but to open fire. We happened to do things that were not part of our direct duties. Once in the neighbourhood of the battalion headquarters in Bolsha Troitskoy, there was an army hospital. The commander gave an order all vehicles bringing ammunition from the rear supply station to the front line when returning to the hospital to evacuate the wounded to the front hospital. At first, some chauffeurs, senior convoys tried to evade it. We had to allocate additional soldiers at the checkpoint to escort the cars to the hospital. In general, there were enough worries. When help was needed, many went to the border guards for it. Meanwhile, the enemy after the defeat at Stalingrad was preparing for a new offensive in the central direction. The German general staff developed a plan for an offensive operation, called Citadel. After a long and thorough preparation, Hitler's troops concentrated on the initial boundaries. But the plan of the German command was unravelled. On the night of July 5th, 1943, shortly before the beginning of the offensive of the Nazi troops, the artillery of our armies and fronts conducted a powerful fire counter-preparation. As a result, the Nazis suffered serious losses, the control of the troops was disrupted. However, the enemy did not give up the offensive. In the morning of the same day, the fascists began artillery and aviation treatment of our defences. Then they attacked it. At us they were advancing on the site of the 69th Infantry Division north of Shebekin. Fierce fighting ensued. During the day, the breakthrough area several times changed hands. The enemy suffered huge losses, but sought to break through our defences at any cost, so continued for several days. The battle unfolded on the ground and in the air. Hitler's command introduced into the battle new tanks, Tigers and Panthers and self-propelled artillery units, Ferdinands, on which they placed special hopes. The soldiers of the 7th Guards Army reflected in some days 12 attacks. A lot of wounded appeared. They were walking on the roads or riding in cars. We had to keep our eyes open. One day, Petty Officer Anisimov stopped a car with the wounded sitting in the back. A Petty Officer Sanitation Officer rudely threw. Can't you see who I'm carrying? Raise the barrier. I see don't hurry, we'll check. Then you'll go. Anisimov calmly answered. How many people do you have on the list? Eighteen with me answered the orderly. Anisimov stood on the wheel, carefully examined those sitting there. A wounded man with his head covered with bloody bandages was huddled at the opposite side. 
He seemed suspicious to the petty officer. Well, he said to the soldier, get off the car. A hail of insulting words fell on Anisimov. One wounded man, who was boiling over, pointed in the direction of the front line and said, Hey, you rear rat, why are you picking on me? Go there, then you'll know how to delay. Don't scare me with the front line. We saw the front line back in June of the 41st. When some of you were still sleeping with a woman, Anisimov objected calmly, moving to the wheel from the other side. Someone sitting in the car poked Anisimov in the chest with a crutch. Don't be a fool, said the petty officer, still restrained. And you, you wounded head, get off. The wounded man was stubborn. The others were making noise. You're mocking a man. They again attacked the border guard. Starshina Anisimov commanded, Kovtun Gichkin to me. The head of the car, too. Take him off. The order was carried out. The wounded in the head and leg stood on the ground and unwrapped the bloody bandages on his healthy body. In the car there were gasps. Anisimov raised the barrier. Now you can go. I'm sorry, friend, apologised to Sergeant Anisimov, the wounded man, who was not in excess of rage. The others were exchanging impressions about the incident. And the petty officer well done, how did he recognise him? Came from the departing car. At the interrogation, the detainee at first said that he chickened out and fled from the battlefield, and in order not to be detained, bandaged himself with picked bandages, having previously cut his finger and smeared the bandages and his uniform with blood. But then he stopped wagging and confessed that he was an agent of the Abwehr intelligence, who had received a task under the guise of a wounded man to penetrate into the rear areas and establish the location of the army reserves thus protecting the army rear areas from enemy spies in the battle that unfolded on a wide front, we made our modest contribution to the defeat of the fascist troops on the Kursk bulge. On July 12th came the turning point in the Battle of Kursk. On July 16th, the German fascist command began to withdraw its troops, which stood against the Seventh Guards Army and other armies. By July 23rd, it was restored the position that was occupied by the troops of both sides by July 4th. However, the Nazi command failed to stabilise the front, despite the fact that it demanded to hold positions to the last man. The Soviet troops launched a powerful counter-attack. On August 5, 1943, they liberated Oral and Belgorod on the same day. For the first time during the Great Patriotic War, a salute was made in Moscow. The capital of our motherland saluted the troops of the Western, Bryansk, Central, Voronezh and Steppe fronts, successfully advancing westward. It was the first 20 artillery salvos from 120 guns. Having learned about the salute, the border guards commented on the event as follows. That's how we live now. It used to be that every gun counted. One gun sometimes decided the outcome of the battle. And now they've allocated 120 guns just for the salute. So there is now and what to beat the Nazis, and what to salute in honour of the victorious blows of our troops. The offensive in the belgorod karkovsky direction continued. On August 6th, the troops of the Voronezh front liquidated Tomorovsky resistance node of the enemy and from the area of Krasnia Yaruga moved to Akhturka. It was that Akhturka, near which in the fall of 1941 border guards of our and other outposts came out of the enemy rear. Now we dictated our own terms to the enemy. Front troops covered Borisov grouping of Hitlerites from the west and east, after fierce fighting, this grouping ceased to exist. On August 12th, the liquidation of the Kharkov grouping of the enemy began. By the end of August 22nd, the Soviet armies bypassed Kharkov. On the night of August 23rd, the decisive assault of the city began. It ended with the liberation of the largest industrial centre in the south of our country. On August 26th, 1943, the newspaper Pravda wrote about the importance of Kharkov liberation the Germans themselves called Kharkov the Eastern Gate to Ukraine, the lock on the door of Ukraine, the key to Ukraine. The victory of the Red Army cracked the German lock, opened the gates and opened the vastness of the Ukrainian land to the Soviet liberation arms. Selected German divisions were defeated near Kharkov, but Hitler's plan of using the whole Ukraine as a base for supplying the brigand German army crashed. 
the dawn of liberation of Ukraine is burning brightly over the Dnieper. The last summer offensive of the German fascist troops ended ingloriously. The attempt of Hitler's command to take revenge for Stalingrad failed. Following the advancing units, our battalion barely had time to clear forests and groves from small groups of the enemy that remained there. Once, having combed another grove, we came to the river. On the flood meadow there were bales of freshly cut hay. A halt was announced. Many soldiers took off their duffel bags and equipment and ran to the water. Suddenly someone shouted, Look, the haystack is swaying as if in an earthquake. And you poke it with a bayonet, it will stop shaking, they advised him. The soldier with all his might struck the hay with his bayonet. Someone cried out. The top of the haystack flew aside. With raised hands rose two figures in German uniforms. The border guards forgot about bathing. Then in one, then in another bale they found thin, overgrown, in tattered uniforms Hitler's soldiers, saying, Hitler kaput, war is not good. The look of the German soldiers was pitiful. How they now did not resemble those self-confident conquerors that in June 1941, with rolled up sleeves and unbuttoned collars of uniforms, stormed our land. However, the Russian man's soul is forgiving and kind. We fed the Germans and then handed them over to the prisoners of war collection point. At the approach to Gravoron, we received an order to move to the section of the Second Shock Army. This army was still in reserve, it was just being prepared to enter the breakthrough, and we could not hurry to Gravoron. In the evening we stopped in one village. The collective farmers asked for help in harvesting bread. We decided to respect the request of the collective farmers. Soldiers and commanders took it with great enthusiasm. With collective farm elders we began to tidy up the surviving inventory, and early in the morning we went to the field. Having missed peaceful labour, the border guards were eagerly harvesting stale wheat. Some of them mowed, others knitted sheaves, others stacked them in bundles. Grain was loaded into wagons and transported to the current. We worked all day long. With a good mood we left this village. On September 28th the troops of the Voranesh front cleared from Hitlerites the left bank of the Dnieper from Lutish to Kremenchuk and captured a bridgehead north of Kanev. The 1st Battalion was ordered to take under protection two ferry and one bridge crossings across the Dnieper in the area of the Bukrinsky bridgehead and together with the army sappers to ensure uninterrupted movement of troops and transport across them. At the same time we were offered to allocate one outpost to guard the camp of German prisoners of war. I sent there a senior Lieutenant Gareth Jamoldinov, who had once served in the internal troops of the NKVD and knew a bit of the specifics of this work. One day I went to the outposts to see how they were doing their duty. In the area of the village Petsinyi, which is five kilometres southwest of the city of Perayaslav Kamalditsky, the bridge together with sappers guarded our first outpost, which took from me Senior Lieutenant K. G. Kolodin, who used to serve in the 92nd Paramishal Border Detachment head of the outpost. We arrived at the time when after the attempt to break through the enemy's defences at the Bukrinsky bridgehead there was a regrouping of forces. The armies were leaving the bridgehead, and instead of them the 59th fortification entered the bridgehead. I remember well. A large amount of equipment and troops were piled up at the crossing. At that time the commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front General of the Army NFF, Vatutin, arrived here. He called the commander of the Sapper Battalion and me and ordered me to immediately disperse the incoming and outgoing troops at the crossing. To fulfil this order, we had to sweat a lot, because the battalions of the fortified area were in no hurry to cross to the right bank, and the returning army units did not go far from the bridge, here at the edge of a small forest arranged a break. All the same, by common efforts the commander's order was fulfilled. In two hours the banks were cleared, and the troops from both sides went over the bridges without delay. The camp of German prisoners of war was a few kilometres from the crossing, and the move to it did not take long. In a large forest in the middle of a clearing was surrounded by a single row of barbed wire, where surrendered Germans were taken. It was one of the transit camps, of which there were now more and more. Almost every day someone arrived here. And now, near the camp, I overtook a column of 200 men, which was being escorted by our fighters. Border guards were guarding the camp externally. Internal affairs were handled by the camp administration, 
assisted by the prisoners of war, who were against the war and fascism. The outpost was housed in several tents standing in the distance. Jay Moldenov settled down in one of them with the political officer and the duty officer. Garif Sadikovich reported that there had been no accidents during the service and offered to inspect the camp. Look, Mikhail Grigorievich, at these conquerors. A thousand and a half German captured soldiers and officers were lying, sitting, standing behind the barbed wire. They were dirty, unshaven, ragged. Those who were closer to the fence rose as we approached. Others met and greeted us with glances. There were different looks, curiosity, fear, anger, humility. More humility. Apparently the masses, drugged and drugged by Hitler's propaganda, had already realised that the war was lost and it was time to think about what to do next. From group to group of German prisoners of war, our military paramedic officer went from group to group, identifying the sick. Anti-epidemic measures were carried out extensively in these camps. The attitude to the prisoners was completely different than in the fascist camps to the Soviet prisoners. It happened that while fighting with diseases among the captured Germans, our doctors and nurses fell ill, and sometimes they even died, having been infected by the patients, to whom they saved their lives. We stood at Pereyaslav Komelnitsky until the November holidays. Here we heard about the liberation of Kiev, the capital of Soviet Ukraine, by our troops. It was a good present to the 26th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Kiev was liberated on November 6th, 1943, together with the 38th Panzer Army and the 3rd Guards Tank Army from the Lutyesh Bridgehead, the soldiers of the 1st Czechoslovak Brigade, with whom fate brought us together in Ifrimovka after their first battle near Sokolov, were advancing on Kiev and liberating it. Border guards of the battalion served with redoubled vigour, performing, in addition to the main tasks, a variety of tasks in the rear of the active army. One of them was the collection and protection of trophy property and military equipment. This work seemed unremarkable, there was nothing heroic in it. But it was an important work, if you look at the case on the scale of the whole army, all the border troops operating in the front line. In the report of the main department of troops to protect the rear of the active Red Army on the results of service for 1943, says in parallel with the fulfilment of their direct tasks NKVD troops to clean up the rear of the fronts collected on the battlefields of trophy and domestic weapons, ammunition and other military property aircraft 85, tanks 659, armoured vehicles and armoured personnel carriers 8, guns of different calibres 230, mortars 547, anti-tank guns 293, machine guns and hand machine guns 1190, machine guns 2487, rifles 34095, 889, artillery shells of various calibres 302827, mines 79098, hand grenades 47086, various cartridges 54674, double one and other military property. A considerable part of this armament and ammunition was left in units and subdivisions for rearmament. The rest was handed over to the Red Army depots. In addition, in the rear of the fronts, 150 warehouses with domestic arms and ammunition left unguarded, and 19 warehouses abandoned by the enemy during the withdrawal, were discovered. The warehouses were handed over to the command of Red Army units and formations. By the end of 1943, the troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front reached the line Ovrach Korostenji to Vera and successfully advanced westward. Interacting with them, fulfilling their tasks to protect the front rear, the units of our regiment also marched along the liberated Soviet land. The offensive continued in winter. At Korson Shevchenkovskoy, a large grouping of German troops was surrounded. It was offered to capitulate. One of the days we received an order to arrive at the command post of the front in the village of Dizorgensi at the disposal of the Special Commissioner Major General Selivanovsky. Get ready to take prisoners, said the general, when I reported about my arrival. But we did not have to take prisoners. Hitler's command, having rejected the offer of surrender, tried to break out of the cauldron. All the next day we brought shells to the Katyushas from a column of cars with ammunition stuck in the snow. If the enemy does not surrender, the artilleryman said, he is destroyed. And some time later, when our troops moved on, there came a radiogram to allocate one of the best outposts of the battalion 
and the most experienced officer to perform a special task. Lieutenant Morkovkin's officer and outpost were placed at the disposal of a representative of the front headquarters, a colonel. A few days later we approached Vinitsa. The city was burning. On the outskirts there was still a battle. The sappers were building storm bridges across the river. The commander of the division that took the city appeared. It is dangerous, comrade general, said one of the border guards. You should save yourself. There is no danger in war, my son, the general replied affectionately and hurried up the sappers. Accompanied by several machine gunners and our staff, the division commander crossed to the opposite bank. We walked with him until he stopped at one burning house. The general looked for a long time at the burned-out eye sockets of the windows, at the flames. Do you feel sorry for the house, comrade general? The division commander, without turning his head, replied. In this house before the war lived my family. The general continued to lead the battle. A representative of the front headquarters, an officer and Morkovkin's outpost left in a direction only known to them. And we moved on through the city. For a few days the battalion headquarters stayed in the town of Litin. Here we detained four important enemy agents. Finally, Lieutenant Morkovkin's outpost returned from a special mission. Morkovkin reported that the outpost had visited Hitler's headquarters near Vinitsa and had done the work assigned to the border guards by a representative of the front headquarters. The soldiers joked. Why didn't they catch Hitler? We will catch Hitler again, border guard said with a smile. Now we know his exact address. So the border guards of the 94th Border Guard Unit had a chance to visit Hitler's headquarters near Vinitsa. We continued our way closer and closer to those places where the war caught us. In the Central State Archive of the Soviet Army on the pages of the archival file, no. 82 rests a small notebook, yellowed from time, on which the handwriting is written. Act. 1944, April month, 27th day. We, the undesigned, the commander of the two SB-92 Frontier Red Banner Regiment Captain Schwid, on the one hand, and the Assistant Chief of Staff 989 Regiment 22 SD Senior Lieutenant Ivanenko, on the other hand, have drawn up this act on the transfer of the defence line to SB-92 PK, P. 2 989th SP, on the right inclusive the railroad, on the left the Prut River west of M. Zabolotova. Zabolotova. Past the commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 92nd PKP, Captain Schwid, received Deputy Chief of Staff of 989 Rifle Regiment Senior Lieutenant Ivanenko. This laconic document reminds about one not very significant event of the past war, in fact a private battle episode, which did not have any serious impact on the course of the battle on the huge front of the big war. But such battles of local importance were sometimes the basis of significant successes, and such even the smallest battles brought closer the hour of our final victory over the hated enemy, and in these battles the enemy was damaged and our Soviet soldiers died the death of heroes. Moving further and further westward behind the advancing troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front, the 92nd Frontier Regiment came closer and closer to the state border of the Soviet Union. Together with the troops of the 27th Army our 1st Battalion acted. It was a heavy thaw. We could hardly keep up with the army units, which by that time were already mostly on wheels. The mood of the border guards was high. The hardest time of the Great Patriotic War was behind us. The enemy was about to be completely expelled from the Soviet land everyone remembered the New Year speech of the head of the Soviet state M. Kalinin, who said that in the New Year of 1944, the Red Army would deliver crushing blows to the Nazi invaders and completely clear the territory of the Soviet motherland from them. By the end of March 1944 our troops, pursuing the enemy, came to the Prut River the border of the Soviet Union and Romania. Here it is, the long-awaited, thrice-desired state border of our fatherland, 33 months ago, trampled by the enemy wrote in those days Pravda. The news about the departure of our troops to the state border was one of the most joyful, and for us border guards it was doubly joyful. After all, it was our native border, the meeting with which we had been waiting for about three years. We couldn't wait to look at it, to say here we are back. 
In these days I received a telegram from the regimental headquarters, in which I was ordered to surrender the duties of Chief of Staff and Battalion Commander, which I performed in one person, and arrive at the disposal of the regiment commander. It is always difficult to part with those with whom you share the hardships of front life, its joys and sorrows, victories and dangers, and so it was this time. After saying goodbye to the soldiers and getting on the horse, I left with regret to the regiment headquarters. Through half-destroyed villages, broken stations, I and my orderly rode to the front, where a continuous stream of cars laden with shells, tractors with guns, columns of tanks, a string of submarines were overtaking us. All this clanked, rumbled, rumbled, pleasing the heart and eyes with irresistible power. They turned off the road, stepped aside, letting the combat vehicles and oncoming columns of German prisoners go to the front line. They did not pay attention to them. It was so usual to see Hitler's soldiers taken into captivity. Front roads quieted down only in the evening. In all nearby villages such a huge number of troops and equipment accumulated for the night that it was practically impossible to shelter there. On the second or third day between the river's southern bug and Prout in a small village, standing aside from the main front roads, we found the headquarters of the regiment. The house housed various services. There were typists pounding on the keys, several officers bent over tables, gluing maps. In a small room at the table sat an unfamiliar major, who turned out to be the new chief of staff of the regiment. Smirnov, he called himself. Wait here, he went into the next room. About five minutes later the door opened. Come in. I was invited. In the room were the regiment commander Colonel Blumin, staff officer Captain Ignatov and deputy commander of the regiment for supplies Major Ritarov. Blumin offered to sit down and, as always, asked about health, talked about the service, asked about the mood of the border guards. We have consulted here and decided to send you to strengthen the 2nd Battalion, said Blumin. You will act as chief of staff of the battalion. This is not a promotion for you, but I think you will take our decision correctly. We need a good, experienced, solid chief of staff in the 2nd Battalion. You've been chosen. Back on the road. We had to find the headquarters of the 2nd Battalion, for which we had to move from the right flank of the 38th Army to its left flank. We had no map. Operational departments of armies gave us border guards, only maps within their strip. So we had to orient ourselves somehow, as it was already dusk, and we were in a clear field. Looking around, we saw a village ahead. Having asked the locals for directions, we decided to spend the night here, and in the morning we hurried to Sniotin, where the headquarters of the 2nd Battalion was located. It was a clean green town, nothing remarkable. Hundreds of such towns are scattered across the Ukrainian land, except that it stood on the bank of the border river Prut. Before the war there was a border outpost in Sniotin, which was burned down by the Germans. One of the streets met us with an orphaned desertedness. Windows and doors were open wide, and on the white walls were blackened inscriptions Jewish ghetto. Spirals of barbed wire were lying around. There were piles of children's shoes and clothes. The street ended in a ravine. On the edge of it stood three houses. Here and settled the headquarters of the 2nd Battalion. After reading the order, Captain Schwid remarked, Well, very well, settle in and take over from Captain Chernov. Captain Schwid commanded the battalion recently, came to this position from the political department of the regiment. Especially close we got acquainted with the deputy commander of the battalion for supplies, Captain Ivan Fedorovich Chokhanov, not for his age, agile and fast. I do not know what attracted us to each other, but we never parted until the end of the war, we travelled together from Sniatin to Potsdam. I had never met a better manager during the whole war. In any situation the personnel of the battalion was provided with everything necessary, I did not want to part with Ivan Fedorovich, but in 1945 he categorically stated, Well, the war is over, let me go home to Lipetsk. I am a civilian by nature, I'll go back to my district consumer union, I'll be restoring my native town. No matter how they persuaded Captain Chokhanov to stay in the army, he only smiled and kept saying, Let me go, I am a civilian man. 
1946 he left. I also liked Lieutenant Mamukov, the commander of one of the platoons of the reserve outpost, an elderly man. Everything about him was somehow thorough and solid, although by nature Mamukov was a funny man, and by profession an artist. He performed before the war in one of the theatres in Moscow. Mamukov fought in the Civil War, after serving in special purpose units. Artistic inclinations did not prevent Lieutenant Mamukov from knowing military affairs perfectly. The platoon was well organised, and the soldiers were characterised by the same firmness and the same vitality as their commander. I remember how they used to sing in the platoon. When entering a village, Mamukov's platoon always sang. And at the rest stops the most frequent sound was O oh, Dnepro, Dnipro. And the villagers who came out to meet the border guards often cried while listening to this song. The outposts took under protection the section of the state border on the bank of the Prut River, and the battalion was like a pre-war commandant's office with the centre in Sneatin. All of us at that time thought that with the access to the state border we were destined to stay on it. In general, there were grounds for such assumptions. From the military councils of the fronts came the order to immediately organise the protection of the state border, although at the same time it was necessary to continue to protect the rear of the fronts and armies. In those April days of 1944, we were still more inclined to believe that we would remain on these borders. Many units settled in the surviving buildings of the former border outposts began to improve them. Other premises were being settled in. All kinds of border guards were sent to the border. This happened not only on the section of our front, but also on the sections of other fronts. From the moment the Red Army units forced the Prut River, i.e. on April 3, 1944, the NKVD troops, guarding the rear of the second Ukrainian front, immediately began to organise the protection of the state border reads one of the documents. One rifle battalion, each from the 24th, 123rd, 124th, 128th border guard regiments was involved in the protection of the state border. In the book Border Troops during the Great Patriotic War 1941-1945, there is a photo which depicts two border guards with automatic rifles in frontier caps near a wide muddy river. The branches of trees are bare. The snow has just melted. On the opposite side of the river hills, the caption under the photo again on the border, Border Guard on the Bank of the Prut River, March 1944. In the spring of the penultimate year of the war, the border guards of the 2nd Battalion also went to protect the state border along the Prut River. One day I went to the right flank of the area protected by the battalion, to the village of Borshev, where there was an outpost commanded by Lieutenant Ivanov. It was a thrilling feeling to see the state border again. The feeling of joy overflowed my heart and soul. Not a lyricist by nature, I felt real excitement moving along the state border. In the village of Borshev I easily found the house where the outpost had settled. Lieutenant Ivanov reported on the results of the service, told me how the security of the section of the border defined by the outpost was organised. Ivanov was a cadre border guard, so he had carefully thought out everything, correctly distributed forces and means. He also had a good assistant Lieutenant Malkov, who before the war had served as an outpost foreman in the Paramichal Detachment. With him we went to the border to check the service of border guards. It was getting dark. The Prut was majestically carrying the spring waters. It was as quiet on the border as it used to be at the outposts before the war. Then we did not know the sound of bombs bursting, or the clanking of German tank tracks, or the shrill howling of mines, or the whistling of bullets. That was the silence that stood by the Prut in those days. A real border silence. We returned to the outpost when it got dark, and I went to another outpost, so I travelled around for a few days. The border along the Prut was locked tight. Gradually party and Soviet leaders of the district began to arrive in the town of Snyati. Village councils were being established everywhere in the villages. Collective farmers were preparing for the spring sowing campaign. Gardens were blooming. Next door to us was a battalion of the 226th Infantry Division, which occupied the defence on the heights behind the Prut River, south of the city of Kolomia. There was no solid line of our troops there. Only the main passes were occupied by small garrisons. 
This forced us to keep a continuous watch over the river. Soon several officers from the headquarters of the 18th Army, headed by Lieutenant General Ozerov, Chief of Staff, and Colonel Slon, a member of the Military Council, were in Sniatin. Colonel Slon was at the same time the first secretary of the Stanislavl Regional Party Committee. He had been one even before the war. One of the commandant's offices of the 94th Border Detachment at that time was stationed on the territory of the Stanislav region. During the elections, Slon came to the commandant's office, met with border guards. The command of the 18th Army had no troops. The army was just entering a new defensive line. Now the 11th and 17th Rifle Corps from the 38th Army, which at that time was repulsing German counterattacks southeast of Stanislav in the area of Tlumak and Kolomia, were transferred to it. The headquarters of the 18th Army was first supposed to be located 30 kilometers north of Zabolotov in Jivozdek, but until the arrival of units General Ozerov and Colonel Slon decided to stay in Sniatin. On April 24th, 1944, we received a radio report from the head of the outpost, Lieutenant Ivanov. At 22.00, at 30 kilometers southwest of Zabolotov, the reconnaissance group under the command of Lieutenant Chaika had a combat encounter with enemy reconnaissance. From the captured documents, it was established that the border guards fought with the reconnaissance group of the 3rd Mountain Division and the Front School of German officers. Battalion commander Captain Shvidia was not in Sniatin. He was in the town of Kitzman, on the left flank of the battalion's section. Therefore, I had to write a report and report everything by radio to the regimental headquarters. From the regimental headquarters came the answer, do not create panic. According to the army headquarters, the enemy is far away, our troops are ahead of you. Probably, Lieutenant Chaika ran into a gang. This telegram made me think. Indeed, just a few days ago in this area was liquidated gang, led by a spy of German intelligence Sikora. The bandits intended to attack the assembly point of the district military enlistment office and take away to the forest conscripts, who were soon to go to the army. Together with the head of the district department of the NKGB, Major Gorshkov, we decided to eliminate the gang, taking advantage of the work of the draft board. We appointed a day for the youth to appear in the village of Karlov to the enlistment office. At night, Major Gorshkov arrived in the village with a group of operative workers. Around the village placed soldiers of the reserve outpost. The command post was moved to the farm Budilov. In the morning in Karluv came the workers of the military enlistment office. The draft board began to work. From the neighbouring villages and farms, those who were to be registered for military service came in groups and singles. By evening a lot of people gathered in the village. Employees of the district military enlistment office held a conversation about the situation at the front and the tasks facing the workers of the village. Everything was quiet, calm. We were beginning to think that the bandits had somehow found out about our plans, as the observers reported. A group of armed men were making their way through the estuary from the Prut River through the bushes to the village. The bandits were heading straight for the ambush of the district police. When they approached, they shouted from the ambush, Stop! Who are those people? In response, the bandits opened fire. They managed to knock down the police barrier. They rushed into the village. Apparently, the bandits thought that they could easily deal with a small group of policemen. But then the bandits were met with machine gun fire by the border guards of Lieutenant Ivanishchev's platoon. Leaving the dead and wounded, the bandits ran away. However, it was not to be. Border guards under the command of political officer Sergeev hit them from the flanks. Bandits fled in a fiery semicircle and began to retreat to the flats. We had to take measures so that nobody escaped from us. The command post of the battalion was covered by our machine gunners, headed by the chief of communications, Lieutenant Burinov. They were ordered to block the way of bandits on a motorcycle. Burinov and the border guards managed to get to the rear of the gang along the riverbank. And when the surviving bandits seemed that they were about to be safe, Machine gunners Drozdov and Kalnikov with Lieutenant Burinov almost at point-blank range hit them. More than a dozen bandits were killed in this battle. About 70 surrendered as prisoners. Only the gang leader Sikora managed to escape, but he too was eventually caught. That was only a few days ago. Could it be the gang again? I had to contact again with the reconnaissance group of Lieutenant Chaika, 
and ask for a detailed report on what had happened. Chaika confirmed that the reconnaissance group was fighting with the advanced units of regular troops. On the morning of April 25th, the head of another outpost, Senior Lieutenant Okrim Chuk, reported an enemy column of 300-400 men, with artillery and mortars, is approaching the village of Debeslavets. Again, we informed the regimental headquarters about the received information. Again, there was a reply, don't panic, check the data. While this radio exchange was going on, the enemy occupied the village of Debeslavets and under cover of artillery and mortar fire, forced the Prut River. Then cut the army communications, highway and railroad from Snyaton to Kolomia, was in the villages of Zamilintsi and Borshev. Lieutenant Burinov, the battalion communications chief, reported that Lieutenant Ivanov reported over the radio that his outpost and Okrenchok's outpost were entrenched at the tobacco factory and were fighting with superior enemy forces. Hitlerites are shelling the city with artillery. That's where the connection broke down. Report everything immediately to the regiment. I ordered Lieutenant Burinov and myself hurried to the headquarters of the 18th Army. Lieutenant General Ozerov and Colonel Slon listened to my report and a member of the military council remarked. We too have now been informed from Zabolotov that the border guards are fighting with regular enemy troops. The chief of army staff unfolded the map and thought for a moment. Then, as if by the way he said, Yes, the situation is such that the enemy can hit the rear of our units or move to Sneatin. Colonel Slon asked me, What do you have in the city? A platoon of machine gunners, two machine guns, a platoon of anti-tank guns. There's an outpost across the river. Is that all? Yes. Liquid summarised General Ozerov, listening to our conversation, and added outpost from the village Elintsi pull back here, to the bridge he pointed to a point on the map. Give the commander the task to cover the southwestern outskirts of Sneatin. Prepare the rest of the units in the city to be thrown into the Zabolotov area. Automobiles will be there now. While the necessary orders were given to the commanders of the units, the battalion commander Captain Schwid returned from Kitzman, who had already been informed by radio that the outposts of the right flank had entered the battle with regular Hitlite troops. He clarified the situation, and having learned about the order of the Chief of Staff of the 18th Army, Lieutenant General Ozerov said, You will stay in Sneatin, and I will go to Zabaloto. The automobiles arrived. A 76mm gun was attached to one of them. Two more armoured cars and a Katyusha crew arrived. Together with Captain Schwid, we went to General Ozerov to report on the fulfilment of his order. Which of you will go to Zabolotov? asked the general. Me, Comrade General, answered Schwid. Good. Lieutenant Colonel Factor will be the head of the group of security units of the army headquarters. I appoint you, Captain Schwid, as commander of the combined group. Act according to the situation. Lieutenant Colonel Factor and his men were already waiting for us. Schwid and Factor got into armoured cars, and the column took the road by alleys. By ten o'clock in the morning it came to the eastern edge of the city. Fighting was going on at the western end. Border guards got off the cars and turned in a chain. Suddenly enemy machine guns hit them in the flank from the window of the railroad box. Armoured vehicles fired several bursts at the booth. But the machine gun fire did not harm the enemy. From the walls only flew crumbs of brick. Machine guns continued to press the border guards to the ground. Seeing that until this firing point was suppressed, it would not be possible to move forward without losses, Captain Schwid decided to turn to the artilleryman. Sergeant Shkoro, tell the gun commander two shells in the window of the booth. There is to tell the gun commander to give two shells in the booth window. But to fulfil the order of the battalion commander is not so easy. Enemy bullets are literally furrowing the ground. Hitlerite's mortars began to hit the border guards. However, Shkuro, jumping up sharply and crawling aside, changing direction, reached the artilleryman. Who is your senior here? I am, responded from the shelter. The battalion commander ordered to roll out the cannon on direct aiming and give two shells through the window of the booth. I can do that. And the soldiers rolled the gun forward. 
On the crest of a small hill they quickly set it. Then came the command. Direct fire, in the window of the booth, two shells fire. One after another, the gunshots rang out. Flames burst out of the window. Enemy machine guns fell silent. The reserve outpost, led by political officer Sergeev, rapidly advanced to the tobacco factory, where the outposts of Lieutenants Okremchuk, Ivanov and scouts of Lieutenant Chaika were defending. With cries of hurrah, the soldiers rushed into a counterattack. The enemy hastily withdrew to the village of Borshev. A street fight ensued. The units led by Lieutenant Colonel Factor arrived. The advancing reached the riverbank on the southwestern outskirts of the village of Borshev. But then the enemy opened a strong artillery and mortar fire. The attack faltered. Then Captain Shvid ordered to move forward armoured vehicles. Under their cover, Lieutenant Ivanishchev's machine gunners and Lieutenant Mamukov's machine gunners advanced. The commander of the guards' mortars gave two volleys on Debislavets. The outpost of senior Lieutenant Okremchuk cleared the rest of the village Borshchev from the enemy. After it, the rest of the units of the combined group broke into the village. The enemy withdrew to the village Zamilintsi. At 18 o'clock, Captain Shvid and Lieutenant Colonel Factor launched a decisive attack on the village of Zamilintsi. In a brutal street battle, the border guards beat the enemy with bayonets and grenades. Three hours later, the resistance of the enemy was finally broken, leaving on the streets of the village. 85 killed, the Nazis hastily withdrew behind the Prut. The outposts, having sent to Sniati the border guards killed in the battle, took up the defence on the left bank of the river. So ended this battle, in which the border guards of the battalion showed selflessness, bravery and courage, defeated the numerically superior enemy, drove him back, which gave the command of the 18th Army to pull up to Zabalotov troops and finally closed the gap formed as a result of a sudden blow of the Germans in the area. Early in the morning of April 28th, on the order of General Ozerov, the 2nd Battalion of the 989th Rifle Regiment took over the defence of the Frontier Guards, and the above-mentioned act was drawn up, which I found in the Central State Archive of the Soviet Army. By evening the 9th Red Banner Plastoon Division, self-propelled artillery regiment and tank brigade came to the Zabolotov area, which completed the defeat of the enemy. Captain Shvid ordered to bury the border guards fallen in battle. There were five of them sergeants Ivan Petrovich Kursanov, Anatoly Ivanovich Borovsky, Ivan Zakharovich Martinenko, Privates Ivan Ivanovich Petrov and Vasily Fomich Tsatsorin. The funeral of the fallen border guards in the battle near Zabolota was held in the city cemetery. Many residents of Snyating came. Secretary of the District Party Committee Pyatunin and Battalion Commander Captain Shvid made a farewell speech. Under the volleys of the gun salute we put to earth the combat comrades, whose life path was cut off on the state border of the motherland in the fight with the enemy. We said goodbye to our comrades in arms, who honestly fulfilled their military duty and fell in battle as heroes. A week after these events a telegram came from the regiment saying that I had to take over the battalion and Captain Shvid had to go to the regiment headquarters. The battalion received a new deputy captain, Ilya Vasilchenko. Lieutenant Pavel Glaviznin was appointed assistant to the battalion chief of staff. Second assistant senior lieutenant, Vesely Kanin. We received an order to leave Sniatin and move to the Lanshin district, a hundred kilometres northwest. The Ukrainian and Moldavian border guard districts were being formed to protect the border. We were to continue to protect the rear of the 38th Army, which was preparing for new battles. June came the month of the beginning of the summer offensive of the Soviet troops. On the eve of it, we learned that the Americans and British landed in France, opening the second front in Europe. The soldiers commented on this news as follows. It's too late for the Allies to realise it. Now even a fool can see that we ourselves will get along with Hitler. The Red Army was advancing on a wide front, giving Hitlerites blow after blow. First on June 10th, 1944, it was inflicted on the Kalian section. Then, on June 23rd in Belarus. On July 13th, the troops of our first Ukrainian front went on the offensive in the Rava Rusk direction. On July 14th, the 38th Army moved to Elvolv. We followed the advancing troops. 
That's when we heard the news which caused universal jubilation Hitler had been assassinated. At that time we did not know the details, but it was pleasant to hear that Hitler was almost killed. The name of Hitler was associated with all the atrocities committed by the Nazis, all the troubles, all the grief, all the tears. Hatred for him was so great that at the mere mention of his name involuntarily clenched fists. The explosion made on July 20th, 1944, in Hitler's headquarters Wolf's Lair, located near the East Prussian town of Rustenburg, was committed, however, not in the name of overthrowing fascism. The conspirators were far from the true interests of the German people. They only wanted to replace Hitler with another figure, so that they could then try to collude with our allies and continue the war on only one front, the Eastern Front. Putsch July 20th served the interests of certain circles of the bourgeoisie, which hoped in this way to prevent a popular uprising against Hitler's government, as soon as the Soviet and Allied troops will cross the borders of Germany, wrote W. Ulbricht. Putsch caused a new wave of terror, but which entailed the weakening of the anti-fascist democratic front. Therefore, at the decisive moment by the time the Soviet troops entered Germany, the anti-fascists did not have enough forces to overthrow Hitler's government. And yet the assassination attempt on Hitler reflected the deepest political crisis in which Nazi Germany fell as a result of the crushing blows of the Red Army. Very soon the border guards of our battalion were to visit the ancestral castle of one of the conspirators, the former German ambassador to the Soviet Union, Werner von Schulenberg. We were looking for him. But before finding ourselves in Germany between the cities of Kverfurth and Freiburg on the steep bank of the river Unstrut, where the ancient castle of Schulenberg was located, we had to travel hundreds of versts along the roads of war. At the beginning of August, the troops of the left wing of the 1st Ukrainian Front, and together with them our regiment, were redeployed to the 4th Ukrainian Front, which on August 6th captured the city of Drogobojch and reached the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains,